Good morning. Wow. Thank you, Sophia. I will endeavor to preach the word of the Lord. <laughs> um, today, we're going to look at John 20, uh, the end of the chapter, John 20. And uh, I'm going to just start off by reading it. I'm going to read uh, John 20, verses 24 through 31. And it says, Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. Let me set the scene for a second, just in case you haven't been following along. Uh, This is after Jesus has died, was buried for three days, rose again. Some people have seen him now. First, Mary Magdalene saw him. And then he appeared to the disciples a week previous to this this, uh, passage, right? So he appeared to the disciples, but Thomas wasn't there, okay? So that's where we're at going forward. Now, Thomas was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them this time. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Same thing he said the first time. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. And we'll stop there for now. Last time we talked about John, it was three weeks ago. Since then, we had a beautiful worship in the arts morning together. And then last week, we had our pancake breakfast together. I really loved both of those times, by the way. I really loved hanging out with y'all in in those settings. Loved it. Um, But three weeks ago, Pastor Tracy shared some amazing wisdom about how uh, when Jesus appeared risen to the disciples, first to Mary Magdalene, then to the group of disciples uh, who were in the room with the door locked except for Thomas. And she was sharing about how they all responded when Jesus appeared to them. And I noticed something that all of the disciples have in common when Jesus shows up is that they weren't expecting to see Jesus alive again. It was unexpected and shocking and not what they were thinking was going to happen. Mary thought it must be the gardener at first. And the disciples didn't believe Mary when she told them that she'd seen the Lord. And then the the disciples saw him. And then Thomas didn't believe the disciples when they said, we've seen the Lord. So it's like a theme. Like they're all having this same response. First of all, like, whoa, is that really Jesus? And then when somebody tells them, they're like, no, I don't, right? I don't, I, I can't believe that. So I think that somehow Thomas, through church history, has been singled out and judged for his incredulity. I can say this word in my head. (laughs) Incredulity. Judged for, like, that he didn't immediately believe the other disciples, right? Um, When, in fact, he responded exactly the same as all of them. 
And I was kind of thinking about it, and I was wondering, I mean, to us, we're reading the, the whole gospel, and we're seeing everything pointing to this. And so, like, we're not surprised because we've grown up with Easter Sunday every year and everybody saying he is risen, right? So we, looking back 2,000 years, it's not the same. But them, in the moment, I was wondering, why were they so surprised by this when, according to the Gospels, he'd been telling them that that's what was going to happen all along. That's what we read anyway. So, and also, as they've traveled along with Jesus, they've seen several people resurrected. They've seen um, the, the son of the widow of Nain. They've seen uh, the daughter of Jairus. I didn't look super deep. Maybe there's a couple more, but most recently they also saw Lazarus raised from the dead. So like they've seen this happen before. And so why are they so, so, so surprised? But then I thought maybe they looked at those raisings and they th thought, like they saw that Jesus had done them. And so now Jesus is dead. And so if he's dead, maybe they thought the raisings were over, like dead along with him. And like who's going to raise him if he is the one who needs to be raised? Um, so maybe that's why it was so expected, even though they'd seen it before. Those were just some musings that I had as I thought about this. Why were they all so shocked? But then at the same time, I would certainly be shocked. So, but let's just talk about Thomas for a little bit. What do we know about Thomas from the Gospel of John? Just from John's Gospel. First of all, there's the twin thing, right? It says it in, in this text. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus. Didymus is a Greek word that means twin. And Thomas comes from Teoma, which is Aramaic for twin. I never knew that before I studied just this to prepare for today. Uh, Thomas means twin, and Didymus means twin. And basically, he, the, the gospel is saying now now, this guy who we call twin, who is also called twin. So both of those names mean twin, and probably that wasn't his original name. Uh, there are some church traditions that say his name was Judas, his original name, which was a common name in that time. And so maybe the twin nickname stuck, especially after the other Judas turned out to be the betrayer. There's also a wisp of tradition that maybe Thomas looked a lot like Jesus. And so it was kind of a joke among the disciples, like, oh, you guys are twins. And then he was called twin. Or maybe he was just a twin. And that was his nickname. We don't know. But that's, I don't know, kind of interesting. I want to tell you guys about it. It doesn't have a huge amount to do with where we're going with this, so stick with me. But we see glimpses of Thomas individually in two other places in John. First, in John 11, when Jesus decided to go to Bethany when Lazarus had died. And the disciples tried to persuade him not to go, saying the religious leaders there tried to kill you last time you were there with stones. And so why do you want to go back there where they want to kill you? But Jesus insisted on going in that story. And Thomas says, and in my head it's 100% an Eeyore voice, I don't know. He's like, let us also go that we may die with him too. I'm not that great at your voice, but yeah, he shows up right there. He says, let us also go that we may die with him, which strikes me as a little dramatic, but also, you know, kind of sold out, you know, he's like, well, I'm in it. So if he's going to go there and die, then I guess I will go too. Let's all go. 
And so that shows us a little bit about Thomas's character, maybe. He was all in. He was ready to die, if that's what lay ahead. Although I find it interesting, he, we don't see anything of his story when Jesus is actually arrested and executed. We don't know what's going on for Thomas then. Thomas has this whole story that we don't get to see in the gospel, and so I really wonder what happened if this was his attitude, you know, but then he's, he's disappeared, so something happened. So he's got all of that going on on the inside, rolling around. The other place we see Thomas individually is John 14. Jesus was saying that his father's house has many rooms, and he was going there to prepare a place for the disciples. And he says, you know the way to the place where I'm going. And then Thomas asked, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? It's a very reasonable question, very factual, maybe kind of missing the layers of meaning that we can look back and see. But in that moment, Thomas is just like, I don't, what? we don't know where you're going. How are we going to know how to follow you if you go somewhere? And so I like to think of Thomas as someone who is interested in facts and realities, someone with strong loyalties and beliefs, someone who maybe missed the deeper meanings at times, but don't we all? And, um, and so those are just two little glimpses of who this guy is. I think he's in his head a lot. I think he's got a lot going on in his head. And Jesus answered his how can we know the way question, by the way, by saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And if you want to come to the Father, you come through me. I just noticed that for Thomas, the question is how? How do we get there? And um, he just seems like a really concrete practical kind of a guy. It's not a full portrait at all, but just from those little glimpses, I feel like Thomas is pretty relatable. Um, he's just a dude. He's honest. He's a bit pessimistic, but he'll tell you what he thinks. And he's gotten kind of a bad rap, you know? Everybody calls him Doubting Thomas. Who, have you guys heard that before, Doubting Thomas? That's like what he's famous for. But like, is doubt unusual or bad? I've always heard him talked about with an admonition not to doubt. But honestly, doubt is a very natural and human response when confronted with the preposterous and unbelievable. Thomas, who strikes me as a plain talker, was just the one to say it clearly. I can't believe this until I see the evidence right in front of me. And here's maybe the main thing that I want us to notice this morning. It's how does Jesus respond to Thomas? in all of this. What does Jesus do? You want to shout it out? He just shows him, right? What'd you say, Dave? He's just, look, Jesus shows up. Jesus just comes and he's like, here I am. I heard you wanted to see my hands. Here they are. You can look, you can touch them. And I don't see an ounce of shame coming from Jesus. I don't see any scolding coming from Jesus. I just see Jesus saying, 
hey, Thomas, I heard you wanted to see what was going on. Look, you can touch it. Here's my hand. Right? The text doesn't even say that Thomas actually touched him. It, uh, it just tells us that he said something remarkable. The first written down confession in the Gospel of John of Jesus as God. Thomas says, my Lord and my God. What a wild ride for Thomas. We don't even know part of it, that part of it where he goes dark during Jesus' arrest and execution, but Thomas has been on a ride, and here he arrives with Jesus coming to him and giving him what he needs. Thomas said, I need to see it, and Jesus was like, here I am, and that was what Thomas needed to be able to believe, and beyond believe that Jesus had ris risen from the dead, he went further than that, and he believed, oh, you're my God. That's huge. That's huge. Can you imagine a Jewish man who had grown up saying over and over, there is one God? And he makes this confession, Jesus, my Lord and my God. Wow. It it's huge. All of this with Thomas's story makes me think about how we all come to faith, come to God, come to Jesus, needing whatever we need in order to let ourselves believe. We catch this frozen moment here in Thomas's journey into belief. We see a glimpse of what he needed to let himself believe the preposterous and unexplainable. And we see that Jesus doesn't withhold himself from Thomas. He comes in and shows him the evidence that Thomas needs. So I want us to just think about ourselves for a minute here and our own journeys into faith. I wonder if there is a resurrection that we have a hard time believing. And I don't mean specifically, do we mean that, do we believe that Jesus rose from the dead? I mean, what does resurrection mean in my life and in your life? What preposterous gift of life do I find it hard to accept? What unbelievable goodness seems just too far-fetched? What is in that category for you and for me? And some of the things I think of, and this is just <laughs> from the top of my head, I think sometimes it's hard for me to believe that that this love is really so big and so free. Or that I'm really not rejected or judged for my mistakes and failures. Or that I'm truly accepted and loved exactly how I am right now. Or that I actually am growing and learning each day. Or that I will become the full embodiment of who and all I'm created to be. Or that I haven't ruined everything. <laughs> Just being real. <laughs> or that it's, it's not too late for my dreams. Those are just some of the things that roll around in me that it's like sometimes maybe I believe that kind of resurrection for myself, and then other days, not so much, right? It's... But if Jesus is saying, go ahead, touch it, the thing that you thought might be dead forever, that you thought would never live, the thing that was too good to believe, look at it standing in front of you. 
that was Thomas's experience, and I think that can be our experience too. And what would that look like for you and I? Maybe touching it just means being honest and opening up to Jesus about it, being honest with myself, not turning away from the pain of loss or disappointment, you know? What does it mean for Jesus' resurrection to flow into our empty spots? What would it be like to let his acceptance melt my incredulity? Maybe it won't look like we think. Maybe we won't get what we wanted, you know? But when the way, the truth, and the life flows into the empty spot of our doubt, it's inevitable that our perspective would change. And we'll see things differently. And we'll see how there's life there after all. So just put a pin in that for a moment, if you would. There are a few more verses in this chapter. And they are sort of a conclusion to this whole gospel. Even though there's like an epilogue that is still to come in the last chapter, which is next. But this conclusion points to why the whole thing was written. It was written for the community of believers who came after. It was written for those who didn't get a chance to see Jesus before he ascended. It was written so that even without seeing him in the flesh, they, we, would still be able to know him and believe. And I must admit, I'm going to share with you my interpretation of this part of scripture because I think that this conclusion starts a bit earlier than is obvious. Because I'm going to put the start right here. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. See that that last thing that Jesus says? I've many times heard what Jesus said there in a scolding way. Right? Like Thomas you're okay, I guess, but not as good as people who believe without seeing me, right? That's, but I realize that's just a judgy attitude. (laughs) That's not exactly there in the text. And when I judge Thomas, I'm actually judging myself. Like, you're okay, I guess, but not as good as these other people. But now I look at this line and I wonder, if it's there to lead into the last bit, which is totally directed at the generations of those who would believe later. Like that last thing written in Jesus's voice in the story is meant to be an encouragement for those who didn't get to see him, right? That first generation of Christians after the disciples, and the second and third, and all the way down a long and tangled spiritual genealogy to us here today. I think rather than being a burn on Thomas, it's an encouragement to us that by believing, we may have life in his name. So now I look at it as either Jesus said that in such a loving way that Thomas didn't feel less than, because I think that Jesus never makes anybody feel less than, 
or maybe those words were put into Jesus' voice by the writer because they were writing to believers um, who were down the line. Regardless, I think it's meant as an encouragement to the community of believers. And there's one more thing that I've been thinking about all this. You know, Scripture calls the believing community the body of Christ. And I just, I know that we all carry these areas of doubt where we can't believe it unless we see it. It's just a human thing that we do. And I think that the thing that we all must see is the body of the risen Christ, just like Thomas. And what does that mean for us? I believe that we are called together as community to show each other and our neighbors what the hope of resurrection looks like. We together are proof of the promise, the wounded hands and side, walking and living and alive. We are the proof of the promise that each person needs, that each one of us needs to be able to touch as we all journey further into faith and acceptance of this good news. You know, when Joni sang this song this morning, Belovedness, it really struck me. I feel like, uh, you know, whatever Thomas was going through in his mind, probably isn't far from what we all go through in our minds of like, I really messed everything up and I just don't think that I can believe the goodness unless I see it. And um, I just want to read some of the words of that song because I think it expresses it really well. You've owned your fear and all your self-loathing. You've owned the voices inside of your head. You've owned the shame and reproach of your failure. But now it's time to own your belovedness. You've owned your your past and how it's defined you. You've owned everything everybody else says. It's time to hear what your father has spoken. It's time to own your belovedness. He says, you're mine. I smiled when I made you. I find you beautiful in every way. My love for you is fierce and unending. I'll come to find you, whatever it takes, my beloved. And so when Jesus came into that room, for Thomas. And Thomas didn't even need to touch it. He was just like, okay, I get it. What does that look like for us? What does it look like for Jesus to come into our room, so to speak, and all of the stuff that rolls around in our heads that makes us makes it really hard for us to be able to let go and believe that God's love really could be that big and that there really is a promise and a hope and a resurrection and a life beyond everything that we've screwed up. Beyond everything that seems like it's lost. What does it look like for Jesus to come in, for you and for me? And just be there, right? That's kind of all that Jesus did. He just was there. And that 
made all the difference for Thomas. And that can make all the difference for us if we'll, like, open our hearts to it. Open our hearts to the reality of the resurrection that Jesus is bringing into our lives.